at Hotspotting, we're increasingly aware that um, property investors uh, are seeking more than passive investment. They want something more dynamic than simply owning a property with a tenant and um, waiting for it to grow in value. Uh, more and more investors are seeking value adding strategies. And so today, uh, I'm talking to Alex Duck from Advisable about ways that you can supercharge your investment strategy through property development. Uh, we're going to look at how to find opportunities with genuine equity uplift, where to find properties that can be developed, areas to steer clear of, how to capitalise on development upswing, um, common mistakes to avoid. So we're going to be um, looking at some case studies. I'm really looking forward to this personally um, because for a long time I've been as a property investor, a passive investor, but increasingly looking to be one of those who seek to accelerate the process by um, doing other things such as uh, subdivisions and, and uh, small developments. So Alex Dutt from Advisable, welcome. Um, over to you for your presentation and uh, perhaps you can start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what uh, Advisable does for property investors. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Terry. Um, I guess, oops, I should say. So who we are, okay, so sorry about that. Um, so I'm Alex Dart. I'm a buyer's agent and property investment advisor. I've been working in the industry for um, over 10 years. I feel like I've been saying over 10 years for a few years now, so it's probably been a little bit longer than that. But um, we are buyer's agents and property investment advisors based in Sydney. Um, we operate under a fee-for-service business model, so we don't actually sell real estate. Our job is to go out there and find the best opportunities in the marketplace for our investor clients. Um, within the past two years, We've purchased over 125 um, properties uh, with a total value of over 50 million. Um, and that's a combination of owner occupier and investment properties, um, but predominantly investment properties. And it also includes development sites, uh, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, we are licensed Australia wide. So as Terry touched on earlier, um, we are buying, running around the country, buying properties uh, in, in most states, there are some states that we're not working in at the moment, just um, because we're not seeing that's the right opportunity, the right time for those states. But predominantly, we've been focusing on Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, and New South Wales. So a few regional spots, but predominantly the capital cities in those states. Um, very importantly, uh, look, we're big advocates of regulation in the industry. Obviously, it's an unregulated industry, but we're big proponents of trying to get regulation in there and we've done everything that we can uh, to get ourselves as qualified as possible. And we're also members of PIPA, so the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, REBA, which is a Real Estate Buyers Agents Association of Australia and the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales. And all of the advisors at Advisable are qualified property investment advisors and fully licensed. Um, yeah, so that's in a nutshell who we are, what we do. Um, before I get into the presentation, a bit of a disclaimer, and that is that, you know, please be advised that the information is contained, is, is general in nature, and does not constitute as personal financial advice. So please check with your um, financial professional um, before, you know, putting forward any of these recommendations or ideas into practice. Okay, so before I get into it, I just wanted to say that property development is a very complex topic. It's a very big topic. Uh, whenever I do a presentation on development, I feel that um, you know trying to squeeze in a lot of information into you know into a uh, into a presentation, a one-hour presentation, um, you know, is a very difficult task. So, and I understand also that you know participants are going to be, I guess, um, you know, in different stages of of you know their investment careers, if you like. So they're going to be different experience levels so hopefully there's something that is you know you're going to get something from this presentation and you find it useful irrespective of where you're at um, within your within your property investment career so um the next thing is i just wanted to say that you know there is a lot of bs out there in prop in real estate um you know and what the present the examples within this presentation are very much achievable. So they're genuine examples, they're achievable. Um, we're not, we're not um, talking about, you know, beasts that don't exist or, or properties that, you know, that don't actually exist. Um, 
Okay, so as Terry kind of touched on, we're going to we're going to zoom through this, um, but we're going to talk about an overview um, of the types of properties that we're referring to and that we help people buy, the advantages of property development, um, how and where to find opportunities with genuine equity uplifts, so opportunities that are genuinely going to make you money and have the potential uh, for value add to make people money, how to crunch the numbers and figure out as quickly as possible. If, if something has potential, um, how to capitalize on a development, even if you're on a limited budget, okay? And some common mistakes, and then a Q&A. So assuming that I don't run out of time, which is kind of my calling card, and obviously with the, uh, the excitement at the start of the presentation in more ways than one, um, hopefully I haven't wasted too much time. Okay, so we might have to zoom through some of this, but the type of property investment development that we're going to be talking about today, we're not talking about buying off the plan or a house and land package from a third party developer. Okay, so we're not referring to investing via a shared ownership structure, syndicate, partnership, trust or investment fund. We're referring to a development that involves the purchase of a, an untapped development site that has a potential for value add. So genuine equity uplift. And most importantly, the investor, so the owner being the sole uh, operator or sole person in control of that asset and that's really important because you know the investor needs to have total control over what happens with the site and also reaping 100% of the benefit or profit and also importantly we're referring to development opportunities that can be financed through standard residential lending and they're accessible to first-time developers so once we start getting into property development uh, it opens a whole um, different dynamic to the idea of property investing. So you're looking at obviously commercial lending potentially depending on the size of the development and banks will start to view it diff very differently and start to analyze or assess the investor based on their experience. So that's important. So I guess on that note, we're going to be looking at development strategies that are going to suit entry level budgets and risk tolerances. Okay. So, um, Typically with development, the more money you've got, the more ability that you can create more money because the more opportunities are going to be at your disposal, the greater the budget. So the types of developments that we could be looking at would be a knockdown rebuild. So basically you find uh, an older home um, or as my business partner Kate would say, a cow shed um, that can be knocked down um, and replaced with a, a new property. Um, or knock down something, demolish something, subdivide. So in other words, create um, an additional lot on the site. So cut up the block into either two or three lots uh, and build two or three new dwellings, so new homes on that site. Or another option is to retain the dwelling that's on the site. So you might find a site that has a property at the front of the block um, and that's in good enough order to working order, serviceable to be um, kept. Maybe it needs a bit of renovation, um, but it has enough access or enough space down the side, either side of the property uh, for a common driveway to be put um, and a battle axe style subdivision to be put in place. And that could be one or two new dwellings on the rear of the block. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. And now we've got, uh, photos we can uh, you can see a visual of what I'm talking about there so um, for lending purposes as I touched on you know we're, we're talking about developments with a maximum of three dwellings on site so once we start to exceed more than three dwellings on site that's when we look at commercial commercial lending we fall under those commercial lending guidelines and that's just a totally different beast um, than standard residential lending which is what most investors are going to be Going to be looking at and predominantly we're talking about uh, purely investment so buying arm's length and just keeping it as an investment um, but the same principles could be applied to your primary place of residence so in other words if you bought or you're looking at buying a site to live in uh, you could potentially use these same development principles to create a new lot or lots out the back of your your home um, obviously there's going to be different um, effects in terms of capital gains tax and the implications that you need to think about, but it could be a strategy that could get you a bit of a leg up as well. Um, and ideally, we're looking at sites that we want to 
develop and hold in the shorter to medium term to avoid um, the full brunt of capital gains tax or any um, GST liability as well. Because once we start to develop the cell, it becomes a commercial venture and technically in the eyes of the ATO, we're professional developers um, and we've got to pay GST accordingly. So we want to try and avoid those things. We want to minimise capital gains tax and avoid GST entirely. So that means that we're looking to develop to hold. So that could be, uh, you know, develop and hold one for over a year to get away from that capital gains tax uh, implication um, and, and sell down the track, or it could be holding on to both for the long term. But the idea is, at least in, for the first year or so, uh, we're looking to holding these, these um, new, new properties that we're developing. Uh, the other option, of course, is to buy a site that has the capacity to have some kind of development potential um, and get the development application approval in place, perform the subdivision and then sell it with an approval or a subdivision in place uh, without actually going through the process for starting construction. So you can sell it with the approval in place and it adds a bit of a, an advantage and a bit of a, a, bit of a premium uh, upon resale. So that could be a, a strategy as well. Um, or the other option that's very popular at the moment with a lot of the investors we're working with is to buy something now uh, with development potential in place and the numbers might not stack up as well as we want now, they might not stack up at all, um, but it has the potential to um, be developed uh, and it's something that we could um, do down the track, so five to ten years. So that, that really turns the whole um, prospect of buying development sites on its on its ear because it enable it just opens the door to look at different areas and different budgets most importantly because a lot of the projects that work right now um, we're going to be talking about some pretty reasonable amounts of money um, but if you're looking at an opportunity to buy on a limited budget then this could be you know, a great option for you and i'll get into that in a bit more detail so this is an example um, project that we purchased um, for a client uh, and it's a typical what we call a splitter block so it's a property um, and I'll show you the property in a minute but and it's not a, it's a bit of a blurry picture but hopefully you get the gist and that is that it's a corner block um, either side uh, front and to the side is uh, that's the nature strip uh, it's north of Brisbane um, it's in a very established owner occupier uh, family centric suburb uh, but basically it had, had what we needed in terms of land size. So in this particular council ward, we're looking at uh, minimum 800 square metres to be subdivided. And we needed frontages uh, of 20 square metres and depth of 40 square metres. So it's just a bit of a fraction to spare, um, but it enables us to, to subdivide, be able to subdivide. And that's what we, we did. So this was the home. Um, Post-war home with a nice asbestos roof, uh, but a big, deep block of land. And that's ultimately what we did to the, the home. Um, and you can see that the old home was put in the, uh, the semi-trailer and to be taken away. Uh, but now we've got a clear site. So Alex, is that, that part of the economics of the, the development that you actually, you don't demolish the existing property, you actually take it away and, and sell it to a relocator, perhaps? Uh, look, potentially, I mean, in this particular case, um, I think we got a pretty good deal from the, the demolition guy in terms of um, the price that um, we paid um, was just under $15,000 to take the, the property away. Um, but I know that some of the materials would have been recycled. Um, yeah, okay. I guess what the the demo guy did with the recycled materials and how he capitalized on that um you know that's that's his win i guess but yeah. the flip side to that is we we got a paid a pretty uh, reasonable price for for the, the demolition so you end up with a, a nice development side a nice size and on a corner block so you've got that uh, makes it a bit easier to to do what you want to do as a development yeah, I mean, look, it's good for access um, and it creates different options for us, um, but it did actually create some complexities with um, how we wanted, and I'll explain this, how we actually wanted to, um, to set up the driveways and things like that and how we had to configure the block. Um, and one of the options was to split the block. Uh, if you have a look, how we split it. 
there. Sorry, there. We could have actually split it on the other axis, but to make take advantage of the 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 block in full, it made sense to have two longer skinnier homes. Okay. Um, okay. So I've got to kind of whiz through this, but basically that was the survey plans, and I've just circled that 816 square meters because it's of interest. Because when I originally bought the block, the title said 814 square meters, but the surveyor was actually able to pick up an extra two square meters when they did the updated survey plan. So. Um, and council accepted that. So a bit of a very small win, but an extra two square metres, that's something. Um, so that's basically um, the new configuration and the new lots. So uh, the yellow arrows that you can see are actually the, the new driveway uh, flyovers over the, um, over the footpath there. Um, and these will be big homes, which I'll show you on the next slide, but we've left enough capacity to have enough space to have in-ground pools at the, the back. So the back of lot one and the front if you like, of lot two. It's actually technically it's the back, but um, it's it's closer to the, the street, if you like. So that was being on the corner block. It meant that we had to um, we had to do a side loaded uh, garage, so slightly different configuration. Um, and that's basically what we're looking at putting in there. So um, that's upstairs and downstairs, and that's a pretty complicated drawing. But basically, it's a five bedroom three bathroom, four living, double lock-up garage, two-storey home, around 275 square metres. And that's the render, uh, render. That's under construction. Um, and it's still under construction, but this is a recent sale in the area um, that sold a couple of months ago for 1.1 million. So we're really capitalising on the second, third home buy market um, in that particular area. But you can see that I mean, when we started the project, we were looking at um, the project working at values of around 900,000. And it's really, uh, you know, we've, we've picked the area very well and it's continued to grow. And that, that's, you know, one of the most important messages is picking the area. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, as another one, as an example, um, similar thing. Subdivision replaced with newer homes. It's slightly smaller, but you get the idea that we're building really capitalise on the owner occupier market in this case. It, of course, they make excellent rental properties, um, but we're really capitalising on the owner occupier market to make the most out of the site. Uh, and I'll get into that in more detail as well. And this one in particular is an interesting one because it's actually a site that we looked at, um, the team looked at last week. So it's in regional Victoria. Uh, it's actually in Bendigo. Um, we decided not to go ahead with it. So it's kind of, uh, it's on the market if anyone wants it for 340, we kind of rejected it, um, but it's out there. It is a live example, um, but I thought it was an interesting example because you can see what others have done either side. So this particular home is actually in really good condition. It's not a bad home at all. It's, um, it's brick, uh, it's pretty well maintained. It'll rent quite well. Uh, and it's got the capacity to be subdivided out the back. So you can see what they've done either side, where basically the lots either side have been subdivided previously. And that's that battle axe style that I talked about, where you've got uh, a common driveway going up the side of the property. And obviously the one on the left has been turned into two lots and the one on the right has been turned into three. So I'd say the one in the middle that's on the market for three, 340 um, could be, has the space to have another lot out the back with the common driveway. And the, the red line boundary that you're seeing is a little bit off kilter, um, but there is enough space to the side of the house. But the issue with this particular one was more about retaining. Uh, there was just too much earthworks that needed to be done and the slope of the block relating to drainage and so on. So there's a few kind of red flags that um, led, led us to, to kind of knock it back. But it's a good example of the type of thing that you could find where you could buy something with the capacity to rent it out in the short term um, and then develop down the track once the land value starts to appreciate a little bit more. Okay, so some of the advantages, I'll whisk through this, um, but that is that obviously we can create some short-term profit. Um, we've got greater control over the investment performance, so we're not relying purely on the market. We can be more hands-on and create, create money, create something from nothing. Um, we're also improving the underlying yield or cash flow of the investment. Uh, and then there's also some, some savings. To, so there's some financial incentives such as 
stamp duty savings because we pay stamp duty on the actual site acquisition but not the construction contract or any of the other costs. And we're also getting greater depreciation. So we're getting full rack depreciation on anything that we build ourselves now with the changes since the budget of a couple of years ago, years ago with depreciation laws changing. Um, but, you know, we'll get some really good uh, depreciation coupled with an improved yield uh, that will obviously improve the cash flow. And then there's some other things we've got benefits of new property, such as obviously higher tenancy or resale appeal, uh, lower maintenance potentially if we've got a good builder. I've got builder's warranty also if we've chosen the right builder and they're still around. Um, but most importantly, we can customise it to really suit the local changing market. So when we're buying a property that's maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, obviously the, the local market at the time was very different. And what I mean by market is in um, buyers and tenants. They wanted different things, they had different expectations um, in terms of the number of bathrooms or mod cons and sizes and so on. So, I mean, so I think that you know, if you're building new, you can really tap into that and cater to exactly what the market wants and really you know, ride, ride that, take advantage of that. And at the end of the day, it's, it's a more challenging and rewarding option for the evolving investor. And I say that because we get a lot of investors that have bought a few buy and holds um, and decide they want something a little bit more dynamic, as kind of Terry mentioned at the top of the presentation um, and talked about, you know, I guess uh, want something that they can they can really be more involved with and, and, and take it to that next level. And look, it's not going to be for everyone. I've worked with many investors that have made significant amounts of money just buying and hold. Uh, and I've also worked with investors that have done the development right out of the gates. So you know, it's it's entirely up to the individual investor. So how to find development opportunities? Um, I think the first thing to do is to to understand that for. What we're talking about is entry level development opportunities. We're not looking at as a looking at it as a, as a replacement for you know the fundamental principles of, of property investment, which is capital growth and so on. We're looking at, at it as a um, you know it's a supplement. So it's an extra layer that you know can make a significant difference, don't get me wrong, but we're still reliant on the underlying market dynamics. So it's very important that um, you know while we're buying while we're developing and we're creating equity, the market is creating equity for us as well. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword that way. So, um, you know, I think that's really important. Because I've taught, I remember talking to investors and they've said to me, well, you know, what's some of the profit margins you've talked about? Um, you know, I've seen those just with buy and hold. And I say, yes, um, but it's not one or the other. It's we want both. We want to be developing and we want to be developing in an area um, that is growing in value as well. And that's really important. So I guess the first thing to understand is look at the areas that you'd be buying in anyway and then kind of drill down and see if they have development potential. And the next thing is to to kind of know the uh, the specific development criteria of, of an area. So you need to understand every area is going to have its you know idiosyncrasies. And when I say area, I say council council area because um, they're going to have different zoning lingos, they're going to have minimum block sizes. Some councils don't even have minimum block sizes they assess. Um, assess sites on a case by case basis. Um, and it's more about how much uh, does the, the footprint of the dwelling or proposed dwelling occupy on the site. We've got boundaries, sizes, setbacks. So setbacks are how far back is the dwelling from the boundaries. Uh, you know, and there's all kinds of peculiar, peculiarities that any area has in terms of wall height, fence height, you name it. So you kind of need to get a real feel for an area and what you can do within an area, um, you know, before you kind of before you go any further, but you can you can see a good way of seeing what other what what's happening in the area. What can be done is by looking at what's on the market, because you can readily spot developments that are being sold um, by by developers. And it could be folks just like us, but you jump on realestate.com and you can see okay what are people are doing and you get ideas that way. Um, the next step would be to get your property wish list together. So figure out what particular suburbs you want, um, what are the block sizes that you're after, and whether you're after vacant land or something with an existing dwelling. Most, in the vast majority of cases, we're looking at something with an existing dwelling on it, just by, it's, it's gonna be the nature of how things work. Um, there's not too many plots of land in the areas that we're buying, um, but also potentially we want something that we can get a bit of rental income 
before we demolish, if we demolish at all. So, but getting that wish list together is really important. Get your money ready. Obviously that's a no brainer. Assemble your professional posse, which I'll explain in the next step. Next slide, sorry. And most importantly, I can't stress this enough, um, to be proactive and focus on securing listings off market. I mean, um, it's no secret that as buyers agents, we really focus on getting off market listings, which is, uh, for those that don't know, that's obviously listings that are not on realestate.com or domain. Uh, they're all through word of mouth. Uh, so they're not on the public domain. And a lot of really good properties sell off market. And when we're talking about development sites, obviously they're in very high demand. Uh, and more often than not, the vast majority of cases, they're gonna sell off market. So you need to approach it very differently. Um, and on that note, I guess be dubious, uh, not necessarily dis entirely dismissive, but be dubious of any sites that you know, are on public, have been languishing, not selling for weeks, uh, because chances are, uh, unless the market's really, really slow and down, um, or potentially the properties are overpriced uh, in terms of the expectations of the, the vendor's expectations are too high, uh, or they bought too high and they're trying to sell high, um, then, you know, I'd be, be kind of curious and, and, and cautious about that, uh, that particular site, so skeptical. Uh, uh, most importantly on that note, be poised to kind of pounce fast. Um, so good sites that tick all the boxes typically don't last long at all. So you're gonna to need to get, know exactly what you want, um, get all your ducks in a row, so your team ready, your, your money ready to go. And when you find something, be prepared to jump on it very quickly. And it's almost a case of the development sites Sometimes you need to um, shoot first, ask questions later. So um, depending on which state you're buying in, it might be a case of just, okay, I see this, it ticks um, preliminary, and from a preliminary standpoint, it ticks most of the boxes. We just need to jump in, grab it, uh, and then we can figure out the rest later uh, by inserting a due diligence clause and things like that. And have patience. So finding good sites uh, is gonna take a little while. And be, you know, I'd add to that, be picky as well. So it's gonna take, it's a bit of a process, we're adding, um, I mean, as an example, when we buy properties, standard buy and hold properties, um, we have around 45 questions that we, due diligence questions that we ask of properties. Um, we, but when we're looking at development, there's, a, there's almost uh, you know, an extra 30 or, or so that we, we also ask. So we, there's, there's a lot of boxes to tick for a development site. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a bit of a process. Um, so your professional team, Naturally, a buyer's agent, I would put them first, um, but you know, they can provide advice on, on the area uh, and property criteria. So tell you what exactly you're looking for, uh, what you need to be building as well. Uh, they'll facilitate the property search, do all the due diligence, the feasibility study, um, before and after evaluations on the property. So um, I might, I'm gonna cover off on a bit of that, but understanding, okay, what's this thing actually worth? Uh, how much should we be paying for it? What's the end value going to be when we realise the development? Uh, they handle negotiations. We'll handle negotiations. We'll oversee the purchase, tenancy, and development process. So, you know, obviously, I like to think that we're a really essential part of the team. Um, uh, so, yep. Buyer's agent, local council. So, you're going to need to befriend someone at local council, and it's not as hard as it sounds. Most local councils are very encouraging of development. Um, some are not, um, but if you're finding the right areas, you'll typically find that it kind of goes hand in hand where um, an area that has, uh, um, is encouraging of development. Um, the, the town planners um, uh, at council are very helpful. So they can give you feedback over the phone. Sorry, Terry, you were gonna say something? Yeah, Alex, uh, just the point of um, councils encouraging development. What we're essentially talking about here is infill development. Um, and I think you, we, we tend to find now across Australia in the major cities, uh, state governments and councils are encouraging that um, as, a, as a counter to urban sprawl. So it is very much the type of development that um, local authorities and state governments do like to see. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and yeah, I should point out, we are talking definitely about infill development. So we're talking about established areas um, where all the infrastructure, roads, transport links, public transport, um, you know, shops, all the amenities are already there. Uh, it's just a matter of, they are so well established that the block sizes are big enough to be turned into two or maybe three blocks. Uh, and that typically happens over time. 
where obviously land sizes get smaller and smaller. Uh, unless you live in my suburb, which is in the inner west of, of Sydney and Balmain, where the land sizes are tiny to begin with, but that's another story. Um, but what you'll find is local councils are, are very, typically very helpful and they'll, you just run a site past them and they'll give you everything you need to know. But there's a lot of things, and again, peculiarities again, within any suburb that you're gonna to need to familiarize yourself with. Um, a solicitor or conveyancer on deck, obviously to review the contract and give you some feedback on title restrictions, anything that's on site um, that you need to, need to be wary of. Um, covenants, so to dictate what you can and can't build on the site and easements in terms of right of access. Um, and you're gonna need a town planner. So a town planner can, technically you, you don't have to have a town planner, but a town planner is someone that's obviously an expert uh, and can give you advice on the DA lodging process and make sure you've got everything in place. Um, and dealing with councils and lodging development applications and so on uh, can be a pretty complex task and be quite painstaking. And I guess it's a little bit like mortgage broking or applying for finance. Um, so a mortgage broker can make a huge difference as can a town planner. So to pull everything together and do the lodging process and make sure it gets turned around as quickly as possible. A surveyor. so. A town planner will engage a surveyor, but you will need a surveyor to draft up plans to support your DA lodgement. Um, a demolition expert, so again, someone to give you advice on clearing the site, whether there's anything funny about, could be, you know, concrete blocks, it could be, um, you know, hazardous materials within the structure that you need to know about that could add to the cost. Um, you know, most um, demo guys will have, well, pretty much all that I've experienced will have you know, asbestos, asbestos removal licenses. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a non-issue that is, but um, it is uh, obviously something to consider and be mindful of if there's anything else, any other contamination on the site. And obviously you're gonna need a builder. So a builder, you wanna engage a builder in the early stages to give you some advice on um, anything that they can see, you know, that, that need anything interesting um, outside the square that they can see on the site. Uh, it could be retaining an earthworks, it could be, uh, drainage, it could be any number of things, but they can give you feedback because obviously they've got experience. And a civil engineer. So a civil engineer is the person that will do all the important stuff in the ground that is absolutely essential. So they'll give you advice on um, the sewage connections, the water connections and the stormwater drainage infrastructure that needs to be put in place. And also a property manager. So a property manager can give you uh, advice on the before and after rental appraisals of the property. So if there's an existing dwelling on site, uh, what's it going to rent for? And then once we finish the development, what kind of rent can we expect? So there's a lot of professionals and a lot of moving parts, uh, but you know, it's important that you kind of get these guys um, in place. And obviously if you've got a buyer's agent, you know, um, you, you're going to have a professional that's already got contacts um, to all these others. Um, so just keep that in mind. So where to find, so some of the areas that we're looking at um, within recent times have been to the northwest of Melbourne. So St Melbourne's to Sydney. So obviously um, the market's changed dramatically and it's kind of bouncing back. Um, and I just want to preempt this by saying that not all of these areas are going to work straight away. So it could be a case of finding opportunities where the metrics look like they'll work within a few years. And what I mean by that is that capital growth, if you buy smartly and you buy properties that can be rented out, have existing dwellings, that the development could be very profitable once you've held it for a couple of years. And all the most successful development stories that I've seen firsthand, uh, not that I've read on the internet or in magazines, but that I've seen firsthand are from uh, investors that have held sites for a number of years before developing. So they bought very well. Um, and again, they rode that capital growth wave uh, and then they develop down the track. The other option um, where developments are quite successful is if you're an owner builder um, and not many people are owner builders. But these are some areas and again, excuse me, it's just a highlight. It's not an all encompassing recommendation in terms of all we're seeing at the moment, but it's just okay. So this is a few of the highlights that we're seeing where areas have got um, some potential. So St Albans, St Sydney in Northwest, Melbourne, Geelong and Bendigo. Uh, Queensland, Brisbane City Council, so the north side, I still really like the north side and I said that 12 months ago and it's done really well and it continues to do really well. And when I say last time, the presentation I did this time last year, 
and then some of the coastal parts of the sunny coast as well. So I say, I mean, particularly in the coastal regions closer to the um, to the beach suburbs, working quite well, uh, quite expensive. In New South Wales, it is getting very difficult to find sites that stack up and that are affordable. So realistically, you're going to be talking well into a million dollars to find something um, that can be uh, developed. Um, but again, as Sydney started to pick up steam, it does make sense to look at it and buy it and hold it and develop it down the track. The only caveat to that would be construction cost in Sydney is astronomical. Uh, in South Australia, the city of Marion, so that's one of our, our preferred areas as well that we're assessing. Uh, and I just want to point out that um, this is by no means easy uh, to find sites in these areas. Um, but I'm not sending on a wild goose chase. They are out there. It's just going to require patience and so on, or maybe even a bit of professional help. So that's just in a nutshell, a couple of the, the areas that we're looking at, a few of the areas. So crunching the numbers. So um, how to figure out if something has potential. So I would suggest working backwards. So rather than looking at a site and saying, okay, they want 340,000 or 800,000, whatever the case may be, how do I figure out if it's profitable? Work backwards. So I would first determine, look at a site and determine the best use for the site. So my rule of thumb with property development is the maximum construction allowable. So allowable by councils only on site that the market will bear. So basically you want the biggest um, structure you can, you can fit. Um, that the council will allow, and also that the market will, um, will, will buy, basically. So that's the rule of thumb. So, um, you know, in the case of that project that I showed you in Brisbane, obviously that was a five bed, three bath, four living, so monstrous house. Um, and the next step is to determine the true market value of the completed development. I'll show you some examples of how we do that. Subtract construction costs. So you're going to need to figure out what construction cost is going to be. And there's a few things. There's, there are some websites online and even actually some of the depreciation websites are, can be give you a ballpark figure. Not entirely accurate, but a bit of a ballpark figure because obviously depreciation is a very different exercise to actual construction cost. As funny as that sounds. Um, but you're going to need to speak to builders ideally to get an idea of what the construction cost would be. And it can vary significantly between quality of construction or quality of finish, um, the quality of the builder, quite frankly, uh, the density. So whether you're building townhouses or big homes, um, the more dense um, the structure. So in other words, townhouses are more expensive to build than big homes because there's less um, open space. Um, could be the same amount of toilets, the same amount of sinks and so on, but um, it's in a more confined space and also location. So as I said, Construction cost in Sydney is incomparable to construction cost in Brisbane or South Australia by comparison. So you then subtract, sorry, subtract the purchase cost for, this, for, um, for the site. So you're going to need to um, guesstimate that, I guess. Um, but look at what do you think ballpark stamp fee would be, any legal fees, and cheekily I've added in buyer's agent fees as well. Um, and then your development costs. So this is where council can help you out or a town planner. So there's a lot of things in there. I know there's a lot of words in there, but there's a lot of considerations in there. And I do have worksheets um, that I can, I can provide, but it gives you an idea of, uh, this is basically some of the things that we're gonna have to be um, considering uh, when we do a development. And this is my, um, I guess, my formula, where I then subtract 13% of the value of the completed development. So what do I mean by that is we're looking at a 15% profit margin, okay? And for some people that could be, for most developers that would be quite skinny, but again, I'm talking about entry level um, developments. So I'm talking about buying the, a, a development that's uh, as affordable as we can find and as low risk as we can find and it's still going to work um, with standard residential lending uh, and it's going to be rentable while we're developing it. So there's a lot of uh, things, obstacles, I guess, with compared to traditional development, if we had a blank canvas and all the money in the world. Um, but it, again, it can be quite profitable. So we need to have realistic profit margins and expectations. But that formula will work uh, and the end result will, result will be the maximum site purchase price. And I'll show you a real example that we did, the Brisbane example, um, to show you this formula. In, in action. 
uh, but determining market value, one of the things I just wanted to show, um, excuse me, is um, I guess it is a real skill as a buyer's agent. I think it's probably one of the top skills that we have is to figuring out what something's actually worth. Um, and I just probably suggest resisting the temptation to use um, computer generated value, valuations. And as an example, I mean, this is a, a property that, um, that we bought uh, for an investor in, uh, in Deer Park last year. Um, it, and it was an off market property. Uh, but we I plugged it in the, on the house and I got a valuation of 541. Um, oops, sorry. Um, I used Real Estate View, it gave me 575. And I used um, Price Finder and it gave me 616. So there's a significant um, difference in the computer generated valuation. So just be very um, cautious of those. So how much did we end up paying? You might be asking. We actually paid 500,000. So price finder gave me 616. Um, so I think we got a very good deal, um, but to be fair, um, I didn't pay 116,000 under market value. I do believe I paid under market value and got a great deal, but um, nobody's that good, uh, not even us. So I guess just be wary of, um, you know, valuations, computer generated valuations. So what you're really gonna need to do is drill down yourself. If you're not using a buyer's agent or a valuer, um, you know, drill down and look at comparable market um, sales. So this is the example, and is an example of the, the lengths that we'd go through. We'd look at, okay, when did it sell for? When was it built? How big is the block? Um, just knowing all the intricacies and how it compares. And that was, you know, just eight. That's the tip of the iceberg. When we do evaluation, we'll go back six to 12 months and see everything. Know the, know, uh, you know, the idiosyncrasies of the market and what's been happening within the marketplace. Uh, but that's a really important thing to, to, to appreciate, you know, what something's actually worth. So um, the numbers in action, uh, the North Brisbane example, uh, we started again to figure out what were the best use uh, of the site would be. And that was two, five bed, three bar, a block of garage, two story homes. Um, so around, I think I mentioned 275 square meters, uh, upstairs, downstairs, uh, within our fresco area. Um, with an allowance for an in-ground pool. And I say allowance because when we come to sell these properties, uh, we'll be putting in a pool at that time. So we actually um, built the gates with, um, sorry, built the fences with a gate to allow for trucks to be driven in and out. So they can put in a pool and it's time to sell because that's the local owner occupier market want pools, but as investment properties, rental properties, we don't want the headache of pools. Um, so the market value of the completed development in this case um, was 950,000 per property. So 1.9 million. Um, and again, you look at that comparable that we saw 1.1 million, which was in a, it's probably a comparable size home, maybe a little bit smaller, has a pool in place, um, has arguably in a slightly nicer part of the suburb. Um, and that one, again, that one sold in July for 1.1. So I've been quite conservative with 950 per home, but 1.9 million is the end value. Construction cost was 694. So again, 275 square meters, give or take um, per dwelling. So 1,267 per square meter, GST inclusive. Um, and that's pretty average, a little bit um, higher than you might pay for a, a traditional investment property. But again, we're building on an occupier quality to really tap into that resale on an occupier market. Purchase costs of the stamp duties, legal fees were 34,000 and your development costs were 94,000 for this one. So all your town planning, a lot of, one of the more expensive items in this was the um, water and sewer uh, infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, because there was a manhole on site, um, which was quite expensive. And QUU, so the Queensland Urban Utilities have just re-upped all, um, all their charges for headworks, which is not great, but it's a fact of life, something we need to know about. And if we took away the 13% value of the completed development, which is 247,000, that's our 15% profit margin. So we are creating, um, uh, we're creating 247,000 worth of equity within this development with all those costs. Okay, so the maximum site purchase price is 830,000. So in other words, if we can 
that's the maximum we want to pay for this development to still be profitable. Uh, and in our case, we bought it off market for 18. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I'm happy to take, if anyone wants to go through this over the phone or send me an email, I'm happy to take them through it in more detail. Um, but in a nutshell, that's the formula that, that I use to figure out quickly if something's going to work. So that 15% profit margin of 247,000, um, which was off the back of, <coughs> excuse me, a um, total project cost of 1.6 million, give or take. So 15%, uh, so that's not a bad earning within 12 to 18 months on top of um, any capital growth upswing that you're getting from buying well. Um, but most importantly, even though we figured out, okay, it's going to work at 8.30, that doesn't mean we need to pay 8.30 because we then need to do our valuation on the site as we would with the in, in valuation. And I know I've really hammered and talked about valuations, but again, I can't stress that enough. So whether we're doing a development or any purchase, you know, it's the most important thing, uh, doing really knowing the market and not being led by uh, what the vendor wants or um, you know, the expectation of the agent or whatever the case may be, or even what we want to pay. Uh, what we think is reasonable in the sense of, okay, we might be a little bit reluctant, but we need to be in line with, with, with the market and we don't want to be, have our expectations too low and be left in the dust and just be searching and searching for that, that property that's reasonably priced that doesn't exist because the market's moved or, or conversely, the last thing we want to do as property investors is to pay too much. So, okay, so here everyone's saying that sounds great, Alex, but I don't have $1.6 million. Um, uh, and I understand, appreciate that, and that's a lot of investors, and particularly at the moment when um, it's, you know, the lending uh, is getting so, you know, so difficult um, as well in terms of actually getting, getting funds. So in that case, my strategy would be, as I kind of touched on at the start, to look at developing, um, buying something that you can buy now, has an existing dwelling on site, um, perfectly serviceable, might need some modest renovations, but it's, it ticks all the other boxes from a development standpoint, but maybe the numbers don't quite stack up, but we can redevelop it later, maybe within five to 10 years. Okay, so again, we're buying in an area that makes sense irrespective of development. So it's a great site, great location, all the, you know, again, we can talk about this at another presentation, but you know, the drill, all the big growth drivers, infrastructure, population, all those things that we need uh, are already there. So the first thing is, again, we determine the best use for the site. We determine the market value of the completed development, but we add in some capital growth. So you can change this to suit your, um, I guess, risk profile and um, your optimism, your pessimism, whatever the case may be, how conservative you are in a nutshell, but figure out, okay, as an example, as a quite reasonably conservative example, I looked at 5% growth compounded over seven years. So if we said, okay, if I was to buy a site for $340,000, I did three townhouses on it, the numbers don't quite stack up, but if they grew by 40%, 5% per annum in the next seven years, and it could take 10 years, uh, would, the, would the development still stack up? And most importantly, can I hold it? Um, so obviously it goes without saying that we're doing um, the numbers on the cash flow and the holding cost. So I'd add 40% to that. I'd then subtract the construction cost as I did before, but I'd put in a 10% contingency um, just for increasing construction costs. And again, you might feel that's a little bit lean. You might want to increase that to be more conservative. Subtract purchase costs, stamp duty, and so on. Subtract development costs. Um, again, with a 10% contingency, if, if um, the utilities companies or council start to charge more as the years go by, which is inevitable. And again, we subtract our 13% of the completed development, which equates to a 15% profit margin. And again, you might look at him bumping that up. Because I mean, the Bendigo example that I did, I did the numbers on the Bendigo example earlier. And if you apply that 40% growth, the profit margin, actually the profit margin goes up to around 30%. So it starts to get a bit more interesting. And this is the power of buying very well uh, and buying something that you can develop down the track. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. I mean, buying developments to develop straight away, they're definitely there, um, but you've got to have that much more money. That's just a fact of life. Um, they are achievable uh, and realistic, but if you look at something that you can develop within 
five to 10 years, again, it's a total game changer and it just really opens up a total, you know, huge world of options. So some of the common mistakes that I've seen are uh, uh, not recognizing the loss of value of subdividing the block. So if you're keeping an existing dwelling on site, make sure that you remember, okay, well, it could be a 1,000 square meter block um, and I paid a particular amount, but obviously if I'm reducing that block size to 400 square meters, for example, and putting two new dwellings at 350 each on the back, then my land value is going down significantly. And I know that sounds like a no brainer, but I guess just pointing that out so when you're doing evaluation on the end development, just keep that in mind because land value is essential as part of valuation. Overlooking drainage, I know that sounds a bit random, but it's something that's, you know, I guess it is very important. Um, I mean, when I first started looking into this, I, um, you know, years ago, I just remember surveyors and, and town planners and civil engineers talking about, oh, great drainage or the drainage could be a bit iffy. And I was, I was just always kind of hung up on, on drainage. Uh, and I guess the point is that it can be, can be very easily rectified. Um, but it could also be very complex to rectify depending on the fall of the, the block. Um, so it's just something retaining an earthworks can, which you help prevent um, poor drainage, um, can be very uh, costly. Um, I think another, another thing I guess is that I see is expecting to profit from a development when land values are too cheap. So I often get investors coming to me and they say, okay, I found a splittable block in X fringe suburb of a capital city. And I say, technically you can split it, but there's not gonna be any profit margin. And the reality is that there's too much available land around the area to make it really, you know, any sense. You know, there's no point going through the, the risk um, and heartache of development. Uh, it's not all heartache, because there's, there's definitely profit at the end of the exercise, but you need to find a site where land is scarce and the land value is significant enough uh, where people will pay a premium for a nice home on that site. Um, so that's one of the things to see. Um, and on that note, I guess, targeting other investors for resale. So looking at homes that only other investors are predominantly looking at. We really wanted to make um, the best use out of a site um, to make the maximum profit on an entry level development site. Uh, we want to be catering to the second and third home buyer market. Um, so, and that's again applies to um, developments that are going to be three dwellings and under. So that's where I've seen the most amount of success because you think about an owner occupier is going to be willing to pay a premium for a, a property. Whereas an investor, most investors, the good ones, savvy ones are going to be relatively shrewd uh, and they're going to pay, pay less. But an owner occupier is going to fall in, fall, uh, can we go in and look at a property, fall in love with it and be willing to pay uh, a premium for that. And the other thing is, I kind of touched on this earlier, but not factoring in the GST implications if developing to sell. So that's a big one. So understanding that if we are developing to sell in the short term, we've got to, we've got to be mindful of um, GST liability. And again, similar to drainage, underestimating infrastructure complexity and cost. So um, just because it, we, you know, you dodged a bullet on another development or a friend did, um, you know, there are some, some real, uh, I guess, uh, unpleasant things that you can discover uh, on the site, um, you know, costs, you know, if, if you need to move manholes, for example, you know, um, you know, it could be a situation where if there's a manhole on site to create a junction um, that connects with another major connection, you're going to need to add an additional manhole and the manhole could be anywhere up to fifteen dollars to $20,000 depending on the depth and what it's for and so on. So, you know, things like that could seem, um, you know, very kind of minor at the outskirts, but they can really, if we're talking about entry level development, can really blow up the profit margins really quickly and make a project a dead in the water. And kind of not enough contingency. So, you know, I, within my development, the, the numbers that I did before within the development calcs, I had contingency in there, but there's any number of things that are going to pop up. So, you know, traffic control that you didn't know about because the you know, plumber needs to block off the street when they do stormwater connections or sewer connections. Um, you know, the council could turn around and say, yep, we'll give you permission. That's what happened on that North Brisbane one, actually. We'll give you permission to redevelop exactly how you like. Um, but uh, you've got to put in a new footpath down the side. 
So and that was ten thousand dollars, which again, that's part of the cost that I've got in there. So that's not coming out of the profit margin. Well, it is, but it's not coming out of that profit margin that I quoted. Again, manholes, retaining and earthworks is a big one, as I mentioned. Um, you know, works to the nature strip. So it could be that yes, you can take the tree out, but we're going to charge you treat that tree on, on the nature strip, but we're going to charge you a premium to plant another one uh, within the ward elsewhere. Or there could be tree lock on one side. There could be temporary power poles that you need, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I don't mean to be putting people off. It's just be mindful of that and expect that some things are going to happen. And delays and delays. Um, you know, council could delay things. Turnaround times within uh, the utilities companies could be delayed. Um, the trades, you know, it could be everything's lined up perfectly to get the trades on site a particular day and it rains. Um, or, you know, something comes up where they didn't get the permits turned around in time. They've got to go to another job. You've got to rebook. Um, it's just being mindful. There's so many moving parts to development. Uh, you really need to be on the ball and just be mindful, mindful like that. Um, and not appreciating restrictions of corner blocks. And we kind of touched on that. And I feel like we've um, you know, really whizzed through this presentation. So hopefully, um, hopefully it was useful. Uh, again, you know, appreciate the uh, appreciate the you know. Any, the patience, if everyone's still with us after the, the you know, the, the misstep at the start, but um, if we've got enough time, maybe a bit of Q&A, Thierry. Uh, thanks, Alex. Yes, um, um, we've just come up to the hour, so um, your timing is pretty good in terms of um, how long the presentation took, and we do have a lot of people who have joined us and have stayed right through to this point, um, and welcome people to type in their, their questions in the Q&A panel or the chat box. Uh, David is asking, um, do you offer advice on uh, purchasing a property in an area that offers a granny flat to be built and rented separately from the main dwelling and um, how that might work? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, we definitely do that. I guess um, it's not going to work in every area. The real trip for um, the, the thing that can catch investors out when doing granny flats is that not all councils will actually allow for a separate lease within a secondary dwelling. So that might not be a deal breaker if you've got uh, one owner, um, but traditionally the purpose of granny flats is we want two different leases. Um, but the other thing I guess to keep in mind with granny flats, and you know we've, we, we can do them, no problem, we've done them. It's more about, I guess, understanding that you are mixing purposes of, of, of properties and it's kind of moving away from the traditional cater to what the market wants because you are creating a bit of a, an anomaly within the market. In some markets, you know, it's highly desirable uh, and people absolutely love granny flats and they love the idea of being able to put their teenage kids locked away in a granny flat or their, their parents-in-law or whatever the case may be uh, on the same property. Um, but if you're looking at two separate leases, you're traditionally mixing demographics. So that might kind of be a bit of an issue with getting tenants, uh, but again, it depends on the area. But long story short, thanks for the question, and yes, we can definitely help. Uh, Mo, Mo is asking, you know, do you advise this kind of property development as a good strategy for a first time, like a, a, even a first home buyer, someone who hasn't even bought their first home? Um, or do you think uh, for that type of person, as a traditional buy and hold a better strategy to start with? It really comes down to the individual. Um, I think that, and as I mentioned at the start, it's a great question. I think that for some investors, the fact of life is that development's just never going to be the right fit for them. There's just uh, too much to think about and the, the risk and, and stress of it all um, is just too much, you know, and that's just the reality. Um, everyone's different. You know, I'm very different in terms of, or unique, I suppose, in how I approach um, property purchases and so on myself. But um, my, my business partner Kate will get a chuckle out of that, sorry about that. But um, as opposed to, you know, some investors I've worked with that are just, you know, very much, uh, you know, development could just be, you know, a no brainer for them and that they're ready to, to jump in boots and all, you know, from, from the get go. But I think it's really important if you are doing it as your first one. And again, I would say this, and you, you're probably, probably thinking to yourself, I would say this, but having professional help is, I think, a must. To do this without any experience, uh, and without, you know, anyone giving with any guidance, I think would be really, really hard. But that's not to say, you know, it doesn't make sense as your first one. I think 
that's one of the key learnings that I think anyone would take out of today's presentation, Alex, and that is the absolute importance of, of having good quality professional advice on board. I mean, I've, I've been around property investment for many decades, but I would not uh, embark on um, the sort of development that we're talking about today without uh, engaging uh, a lot of the professional help. And I think it's absolutely essential that people do that. Um, and I think um, one, one of the, the learnings I got very clearly was the how, how exact you have to be. The example in Wavell Heights where um, it needed to be 20 metres by 40 metres and it was just barely over that that minimum size. Um, if you get that wrong, you can uh, buy something that just you're not allowed to do what you, you thought you were able to do. You, and you do need help to get those things as exact as you need to be. Absolutely. And it could also have been that the, I mean, if you, I'm not sure if you remember, but the block itself had a little notch out of the corner. So it wasn't as simple as being, you know, just over 40 by 20. There was actually a little cutout on the corner. And it's understanding that even if we subdivide and split it down the middle, the block side is still going to be, block size, I should say, is still going to be over 400 square metres, even with that little notch out of the corner. So there's a bit of trigonometry to be, you know, looked into to figure out that, um, you know, that the block size is actually... Yeah. Well, Scott is asking, and a good question, when working out your return on investment, do you, est do you estimate the expected turnaround time, whether it's 12 months or 24 months? Uh, you gave some examples of a, perhaps a, a projected profit margin close to 250000 in one example. Is that on the basis of a 12-month a turnaround or a 24-month turnaround? Is that a factor in your sums? Um, yeah, good, great question. It's about um, that particular one was around 16 months uh, and it's um, based, I mean, the holding costs are within that, um, within those development costs. They are tax deductible, but that's absolutely essential um, because when you talk about delays and that's part of our contingency as well, um, you've got to understand that, you know, you're not getting an income from that, from that site. It's still tax deductible because you're developing it. It's an investment um, that's intention is to be earning an income so there's no problem there from an ato standpoint but you've still got to physically come up with the money so if you've bought a site uh, you've demolished um or even if you know you, you demolished you bought and demolished before there was a tenant in place there's no rent coming in um, but the bank's still going to be uh, knocking on your door every uh every week uh, uh, sorry every month asking for that loan repayment so you know it's important that you've done the numbers and understand that you can afford that and you've got the funds to cover uh, the, you know, the interest uh, for the site and then progress drawdowns as well. So when you start construction interest on that and all the development costs, you've got those funds. And from a lending standpoint, uh, you know, with development, you can borrow to develop, sorry, borrow to purchase the underlying site. So you can offer that as collateral. You can offer um, the construction contracts as collateral. So you can borrow against them but you can't borrow to get, you can't, there's nothing that you can, um, there's no security within the um, development costs and purchase costs and so on. So you've got to use equity or cash to fund those. So, you know, your LVRs, your loan to value ratios are going to be quite different um, with development. In other words, you're going to need to have more money up front to do it again. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, we might wrap up shortly. We've been going about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, I just want to perhaps finish on um, what I think is a very important point. That's the importance of being patient when looking for the right side. I know from my own experience, and I'm sure your experience as well, uh, Alex, that the, the absolute perfect sites are out there, but they don't sort of pop up that easily. And there might be a tendency to grow impatient and to grab something that ticks maybe 80% of the boxes, but not all of them. And I think it's really important for people to be patient and to wait till they get a site that does tick all the boxes. Otherwise, the, the, the numbers may not add up at the end of the day and you could end up with a disappointing result. Absolutely. And um, it's a great point. And the, the, the sad reality is that, you know, if you're starting out and you're trying to do this yourself, then it's that much harder. And again, you're probably looking at me saying, well, the buyer's agent would say that, but it is the reality. And that particular wave will height side, I mean, that's off the back of um, a relationship that I had with a selling agent for, for over eight years. Uh, and it was the first call, he knew exactly what I wanted, what I was looking for, what my client was looking for, the budget. He knew, he knew that based on experience and working with me that we were ready to go and we could move on it very quickly. 
came to an arrangement, um, you know, came on the market late in the week, uh, I think on a Friday, and by Sunday I had it under contract. So again, that's not every case, so that's one extreme example, but I guess it just illustrates the point that the good sites, um, you know, there's a lot of work involved in finding them and patients, but they are out there, you can find them yourself, but it's just gonna be, you know, require patience and diligence. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much, Alex, for a great presentation. As an investor myself who's looking to do more of the sorts of developments that you're talking about today, I found it really informative, really useful. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I like the numbers and action examples, um, the case studies that show actual developments that you've been party to and how it works and how you can work back um, from the, uh, the uh, end result you want to to tell you and determine how much you should pay for a site as a maximum. I found that all particularly useful. And I'm sure people out there watching and listening did too. Um, notwithstanding the technology problems at the beginning, we, we've had good numbers stayed live. Everybody stayed right through to this, this okay. point. So um, thank you very much for your perseverance. And I know you would have found it really, really useful as I did. Anybody who wants to uh, follow up, ask further questions, perhaps, um, engage advisable to get yourself on the path of doing this kind of property investing um, the contact details are on the screen um, please follow up um, I'm sure they would welcome to hear from you either by phone or by by email so thanks again Alex it's been uh, great doing this presentation let's do another one in a few months time because I just think there's a lot of people out there would find it um, more than useful Sounds good. And if anyone's got any PowerPoint uh, tips for me for next time, I'm gladly uh, glad to take those too. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everybody who Thanks, particip everyone. participated today. This is Terry Ryder from hotspotting.com.au signing off. But let's do this again really soon. Thank you.